America, a tin hat. I age mites. 16. That's the magic number needed. And before any of you smart Alex ask, the answer is no. That's not the number of pallbearers that'll be needed to carry Jason at the time of his demise. That's the number of three-pointers that Steph Curry's gonna need to hit for the Golden State Warriors to become the all-time leader in three-pointers, mate. When he does this, he's gonna surpass the record that's been held by Ray Allen, AKA Jesus Shuttlesworth. Now, Ray holds the record of 2,973 three-pointers, mate. All right, that's a record that he's held admirably ever since 2014. 13? That's the most three-pointers Steph has ever made in the game, so to say 16, that's not incomprehensible, okay? See, it's really not a matter of if Steph will break the record, but it's just simply a matter of when Steph will break the record. See, because after tonight, the Golden State Warriors are gonna embark on a five-game road trip, so it's just, it's just that plain and simple. See, some people say that I, AKA Uncle Jimmy, they say I don't have a dog in this fight. But I would like to tell you, as the French say, au contraire, mon frère. See, word on the street is that if Steph breaks this record in Golden State, his mother, Sonia, she's going to give a celebratory dance for the ages. Word is that she's going to do a dance that's going to make Cardi B blush. And I'm here to tell you, Uncle Jimmy likes what God likes. And that ain't nothing but the truth. So I'm here to tell you, I can't wait. Listen here, man, we got a great show planned for you today. It's Wednesday, or as the heathens call it, hump day. But we as fearless, we at fearless, we call it two Wednesday Harmony, okay? We got Pastor Anthony. He's gonna be in here today to sprinkle us with some of that good old gospel. And also, we still got creeping around here in the hallways in the studio, we got the real TJ Moe. He's gonna be in here all day long, off and on, and he's gonna be discussing a plethora of things going on with Jason all day long. You gotta check him out. Now, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday, Harmony, and you know, the Bible said that God created the woman from the rib of the man. And I guarantee you that when he did it, she looked just like our next guest. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the show the first lady of the Fearless family, <laughs> and of course, I'm talking about Shamika, the real Michelle. She's gonna be in here to chomp it up with Jason and discuss his latest little fire starter that he laid down. You gotta check it out. And next, we have the man that has no fear of wearing out his welcome here in the Fearless family. And of course, I'm not talking about any other person than Steve Kim. He's once again gonna be back here with us. I told you yesterday that Uncle Jimmy was bilingual. So let me break it down for you like this again. Korean in the house. That's right. He's gonna be back here to take up where he left off yesterday. Our guy, Steve Kim. Can't wait. And then new, we got a new contributor to the show, guys. She's a writer for The Federalist. Her name is Joy Pullman. She's joining the show today to discuss the persecution of the Christians in Finland. So can't wait to hear it. Can't wait to hear that story. People, it's about that time. I told you before that if you hear any noise, it's just me and my boys. So what do you need to do? You need to hit me. You need to hit the like. You need to hit the subscribe. You need to give me a dilly dilly if you feel me. And don't forget, it's not, it, the man's not content with one or two stars. Anybody with a half an eye can see that Jason needs to be supersized. He needs five stars. And my mother used to say back in the day, she used to say, God don't make no mess, baby. I don't mean no disrespect, but grandma, it's evident you haven't seen the host of this show because every day he's a hot mess. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Jason, the big hipped one, Whitlock, give it up.
Uh, thank you, Uncle Jimmy. Uh, nice job as always, but I may be getting tired of the fat jokes. I'm not that fat. Look how good I look. Uh, all right. Great show, uh, as always. Let's start with this fire. I'm going to roll out to Chicago and talk about Jussie Smollett. Smollett destroyed his career and reputation trying to live up to a racist expectation of blackness. It's the same mistake former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick made. Popular cultures, puppet masters, academia, big tech social media apps, the executives running the TV, movie, and music industry and sports industries, and the political left, they have established victimhood as the highest form of blackness. Attaining victim status is the primary expectation placed on American black men. Meeting this expectation is especially important for mixed-raced, wealthy celebrities. In the culture created by the left, victimhood is their rite of passage into the fraternity of blackness. As much as I despise Smollett for the 2019 racial hoax he staged in Chicago, the alleged crime that currently has him on trial, my disdain for the culture that baited him into the act far exceeds my disgust towards Smollett. Smollett, the child of a black woman and a white Jewish man, did what the culture told him to do and what the culture puts enormous pressure on half black, half white kids to do. Prove their blackness. In modern American culture, there's nothing blacker than being worthy of a white man's aggression. Smollett isn't worthy, so he allegedly paid two black men to pose as white and attack him. The whole scenario is funny until you consider the sadness of the mental state that would devise such a scheme and a culture that would entice it. Smollett and Kaepernick, the self-made national anthem martyr, are victims. They're victims of the racist expectations imposed on them by a sick, secular culture. At different levels, all American black people are victims of this culture. Human beings respond to expectations. Expectations can be and should be the greatest gift imposed on human beings. Expectations inspire behavior and shape mindsets. Tuesday night, I had dinner with two friends. We engaged in a debate about white privilege. What is it? Does it exist? Can it be fixed? I argued that white privilege certainly exists in America and that the greatest white privilege is expectations that align with success. White people are expected to achieve academically. They're expected to master the English language. They're expected to have good credit. They're expected to show up on time. They're expected not to use the N-word. They're expected to make an effort to avoid racist thoughts and actions. They're expected to wed the mother and father of their children. Do all white people meet these expectations? Absolutely not. But being born into a world that expects you to adopt principles and behaviors that lead to success is a privilege that puts you far ahead of people who don't have those expectations. Black people, as a collective, don't have those expectations. Popular culture, as controlled by liberals, removes virtually all expectations from black people, particularly black men. We're expected to excel at football and basketball, and we're expected to meet the liberal standard of blackness. Anything we do or achieve beyond that is considered a bonus. The lack of expectations imposed on black people is the most racist act in America. It's far more racist than Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck and back. Had George Floyd entered a world that expected him to achieve beyond the athletic field, he would have been much less likely to find himself needing to be restrained by police. The lack of expectations placed on black people is systemic racism. Victimhood being the highest level of blackness is systemic racism. 
Jussie Smollett is a victim of the systemic racism maintained by white liberals. On Tuesday, while being cross-examined by the prosecution, Smollett complained that the white prosecutor was offending the black people in the courtroom by reading aloud Smollett's direct messages to one of his alleged black attackers. Smollett repeatedly used the N-word in the direct messages. The prosecutor apologized and asked Smollett to read the direct messages. Smollett, of course, obliged. See, we expect black people to call each other derogatory names. It's acceptable and appropriate. We've been programmed to hate ourselves and express our self-hatred in writing, music, and acts of violence. We expect it. Our expectations for white people are much different. We're shocked and outraged when they mimic our anti-black behavior. We don't expect that from them. We're determined to rid them of that negative behavior. Our expectations for ourselves are much lower and or non-existent. That's why it's easy for us to ignore thousands of gang murders in black neighborhoods and hold summer long protests over a tiny handful of police involved shootings. That's why Jesse Smollett has no problem saying the N word repeatedly, but is mortified when a white man reads his words inside a courtroom. We're victims of the racist expectations we've adopted. That's my fire. Love this fire. I love that I have TJ Moe here in studio, because one thing TJ is not is scared. <laughs> uh, and I've got Shamika Michelle in North Carolina, and we know Shamoke Show ain't scared. So uh, TJ, I have my expectations are for Shamika to go first. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to put you in a little holding pattern and I want to, Shamika, what do you think of my take that expectations and the lack of them for black people, I, I sincerely believe that that is the most racist thing we have going in America. When you place no expectations on a child, an adult, or whatever, you're inviting chaos and dysfunction and, and behavior that is not mature or responsible or behavior that will lead to success. I honestly believe it's our lack of expectations that's the most racist thing that black people experience here in America. I totally agree. I was just having this conversation with a friend the other day, and she was saying that she enjoyed a podcast that I did with someone who was talking about how even though his father wasn't around, he really wanted to learn how to be a man. And so he made an effort to learn what it is a man is supposed to do and how he's supposed to treat his wife and how he's supposed to raise his children. And we were just talking about how if someone can do this without a father, why do we give excuses for other people and just say, oh, you know, they didn't have a dad or their mom wasn't this or that or they lived in, you know, a poor neighborhood. When you see people all day who actually make it out of these negative places, then it can't be skin color that actually holds you back. It has to be something else. But we do have such low expectations for black people that we just want to automatically make anything an excuse for us not to achieve. And that's not acceptable. This is why I laugh sometimes when people say, oh, my God, you're so articulate. And I'm thinking, I was raised and educated right here in America. The same English that you were taught, I, were, I was taught the same thing. So it's funny to me because I think that people just don't expect us to do well and, and we don't expect to have to exceed and do well, which is why we complain when we say things like, oh, I have to be 10 times better. Okay, be 10 times better then. What, what are you complaining about? You know what, I, I, I used to, that idiom used to be true, that 
uh, there was a belief that, hey, black people, we had to be twice as good to get the same amount of respect, credit, success. That used to be true, I think, in my mother's generation, my father's generation, maybe even the very early part of my generation. That's no longer true. And, and we need to cut it out and quit pretending like it's true. I just read a story or read the headline, I'm gonna read the story, that USA Today wrote yesterday, I believe, about how math is racist. <laughs> and math is racist because black people aren't doing well at math. And, and again, this is just this lowering of expectations. And, and, and I think that, I, I wanna ask you a follow-up about Jesse Smollett because we've, the one expectation we have put on black people is like, man, you gotta be a victim, and then you've reached the highest level of blackness. I believe that's what was motivating Jussie Smollett. He's half black, half white. Uh, I'm sure he experienced uh, a lot of identity issues and probably still dealing with them. He's also alternative lifestyle and his sex life. So, you know, he was born uh, half black, half white in a culture that tries to make you choose sides. As it relates to race, you can't uh, reflect it when you're half black, half white, you can't say. I'm half black, half white, that you know, you, you must choose a side. And then th there is a struggle with when, you know, your alternative lifestyle. And so he, he's got some identity issues. And I could, this guy reached his late 30s and decided the best way to get his black cred is to be attacked by white people, particularly white Trump supporters. And I, I think it was just a desperate attempt, no different than Colin Kaepernick and his national anthem kneeling, just mixed race, what I call African Americans, and I don't say that derisively, I'd say it accurately, African Americans desperately trying to prove their blackness. You know, Jason, they keep coming, they keep showing us examples that this is true. So this isn't something that we're just saying because we want to be more divisive. This is actually true, true from Jesse Smollett to Colin Kaepernick to Trevor Noah, you know, to Sean King, all of these people that are the light brights, almost whites. This is how they feel like they need to get their street cred. And one of the things that is very insulting to me when it comes to uh, black people, People and you talk about, you know, math being racist. Why is it that you can take a dog to a trainer, any color dog, and you expect if you tell that trainer, I want my dog to be able to sit, roll over, fetch, you know, you expect to go back and pick that dog up and that dog can sit, roll over and fetch. But somehow a black person, we learn less than dogs. Somehow we're supposed to be treated differently. Well, why is it that a dog can learn, you know, if I take my black dog to the trainer, I'm going to pick my black dog up, expecting it to have learned exactly what I took it there for. So why is it that we put our black kids in school and expect them not, you know, don't have those same expectations for those black kids? It's, it's bothersome and it's very insulting. And I don't even understand why we don't even see it at that level. We should be outraged when anybody thinks that we can't achieve or do the same things as someone else. We should be angry about that instead of trying to be victims. Uh, because we're a very fact-based, factual show, uh, Sean King is full-blown white. Uh, okay. I know he lies <laughs> and tries to pretend to be half black. He's not. It's a gimmick. Uh, TJ, I want to bring you into this conversation. I want to start here with perhaps a little bit of a curveball, put you on the spot. You played college football in the SEC, uh, college football particularly at that level, dominated by black players, probably 70% of your locker room, no different. Well, my, I've played in the 80s. 90% of the scholarship players. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. black. Yeah. And so, I, 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 particularly in this era now where rap music is so associated with football and basketball and sports, when, when the, the music sometimes played in the weight room, in the locker room and the language that black players and black athletes and black people use around each other. As a white person, when you 
here in the end were just tossed around everywhere in the music, your teammates tossing around. What is your reaction? What is your thoughts? I think most, I came from the suburbs, a very white suburb. And so um, we were not used to hearing that very often uh, where we were. It certainly wasn't part of our everyday vernacular. And so you would, you know, we had, we had on my football team, we had some black dudes, but not too many. And they would say it, but it really wasn't allowed because it was, you had, you know, 90% of our team and all of our coaches, and we had one or two black coaches, but it was pretty much, hey, we don't talk like that around here. And as 16 year old kids, you say, okay. As 21 year old men, you don't usually say, okay. So that was not enforced the same way in college as it was when I was in high school. But we did have what I thought some unbelievable leaders, maybe the best leader I've been around, period, was Pat Ivey. Uh, you may have had a chance to meet him. He played at Mizzou back in the 90s, he was our strength coach. And what he always said was, you should have enough respect for yourself to use proper language. Don't talk about yourself that way. If you don't want other people talking about yourself that way, don't you do it either. And so guys would still do it. It wasn't like, you know, walk around giving guys tickets for it. But the idea was, these are our expectations. If you want to get where you want to go, start speaking like that. So things were a lot less political even 10 years ago. I, I graduated in 2012. This was not the issue. Now it is as if you have committed the world's greatest sin, which is why it was a little bit funny during the Kyle Rittenhouse thing where the guy made fun of the, uh, made fun of him saying the N-word as if it was no big deal. Meanwhile, the entire Wolf's Gold community is telling you that is the world's greatest sin. You would rather be murdered than called the N-word. Wanted to start there. I know you had some maybe additional other thoughts about Jussie Smollett. Jesse is interesting. I, I was, you, when you see weird stories like this, like the average person would say, why would you ever do this? And I was listening to the show yesterday, of course. John McCorder, Jay McCorder, if you listen to Jimmy, John McCorder <laughs> said yesterday that being woke is a religion. And what is it, the third wave or so. Delano came up and I think explained it even better. He said it is a religion without the opportunity for redemption. You're not getting a whole lot of people volunteer to join that. You know, recruiting not going real well when you're trying to get people to join a religion with no redemption. So what happens is you try to magnify every instance of something terrible that occurs to say this is actually America. There's not enough supply, as you have said in the past year, of racism and hate crimes to meet the demand. So you end up forcing something like this. So while, while I think it was an unbelievably selfish act, a lot of people think it was about his contract with Empire and and the other parts, I actually think that this is evidence of ideological obsession. And I'll give you an example. There was a, uh, I think we can get it up on the screen here. There was a poll taken by Axios yesterday, and it was Democrats versus Republicans, and these are college kids, the, the wokest among us. And you've got, the, the idea is college kids who would not go out on a date with somebody with an, who voted for the opposing presidential candidate, somebody who uh, would not shop at a business owned by somebody who voted for the other presidential candidate, be friends with, and such. And it's up here on the screen. This is terrifying. We are living in two different worlds. Okay, so you have 41% of people, Democrats here, that say they would not shop or support a business of somebody who voted for the opposite candidate. You have 37% who says they will not be friends with somebody who voted for President Trump, or, or they said in this case, any opposing candidate. 30% won't work for somebody. Somebody who's paying your bills, they won't work for somebody. Meanwhile, if you wanna know what Republicans think, only 7% wouldn't shop at that business. Only 5% wouldn't be friends with. Only 7% wouldn't work for. So you have a tiny minority of this, this group that everybody tries to magnify and say that Republicans are so bad they don't want any part of us coexist. Remember that stupid bumper sticker we always used to see, coexist? Republicans weren't the ones with that on the back of their uh, car. It's always right next to a Bernie sticker. I thought Democrats wanted to coexist, everybody be together. Turns out they're the ones that want nothing to do with us at all. I, and, and Shamik, I'm gonna throw this back in your lap and then we'll let you go, but I, I continue and consistently keep making the argument on this show, and it's, I, I sincerely believe it. It's the people on the left, the Democrats, who are the actual racists, who actually want racism to flourish. That's why they're promoting separate but equal ideas and safe spaces. And I, I, I just, 
I think it's so crystal clear, and that's why I keep writing about it and just keep talking about it and trying to put it in people's face. Like, no, it is the left that is telling you that, uh, hey, I'm on your team, but they're really not. It's a lie. It's a hustle, and it's so obvious. I just don't see why we can't see through it. For sure. And I want to tell TJ, they give these surveys also to, I know for sure, high school kids. When my children were home last year during the pandemic, they were taking these type of surveys all the time. And I was just trying to figure out what does this have to do with them getting a good education? Like almost daily, they were taking these type of surveys. And when it comes to the left being the most racist, that's how they pull on our heartstrings. I feel like if they can continue to tell us that someone is trying to take us back to slavery or take us back to Jim Crow days, then we are, as black people, we're, we're the uh, puppets. You know, they can easily just pull our strings because no one wants to go back to slavery. No one wants to go back to the days of Jim Crow. And so they tell us these things and they continue to push racism and division so that they can continue to control us. And and until people actually wake up for real, we'll continue to be controlled and they will have this and they'll have us in their pockets the way they want us. Uh, thank you, Ms. Shamika. Great job. TJ, I believe you had another point you wanted to make about Jesse. Two quick asides here. One, uh, you were talking about mixed race. If being white in America is so much better than being black in America, why is it that I've never met a mixed race person who calls himself white? I, I th you haven't met, but I think there are some, and they are mostly the ones who can pass for being white in terms of it's hard to discern the blackness in them, and so they just play the white role. But, but you're right in terms of all of the, what, it's not just do they claim back blackness, they basically abandon the whole white half of them. Mm -hmm. And what blows my mind about Colin Kaepernick is, it was the white half of him. His mother who bore him and gave him up for adoption, he never met his father. And then those two adoptive white parents, I'm just sorry, I don't understand why he wouldn't be taking immense pride in the group that actually nourished him to, you know, everybody else abandoned him. And so I don't understand why he wouldn't claim that he's half black and half white. But I do get, if you want to avoid expectations and the responsibilities that go along with expectations, choosing the black route is the much easier way to go. You're free to do any damn thing you want, and someone's going to rationalize and excuse it. If you're late for work, you're like, you know, this black guy, he's late. <laughs> what do you expect? One other thing. I was trying to think through the logic behind this, because people do crazy things like this, that you have to try to catch up to their logic, and boy, do you have to tie yourself in a pretzel to get there. But doesn't, doesn't the expectation that Jesse Smollett, Smollett, however you say his name, had actually proved the opposite of what his worldview is, meaning this. He wanted to get a raise, he had a contract dispute at Empire. He knew, or at least expected, that if he were the victim of a violent, heinous, terrible crime, that America would rally behind him and he would get everything he wants. Is that a sign of a terribly racist place that hates gay blacks, or is it a sign of a, of a country that would go out riot in the streets and say, this is unacceptable, not here, and you give this man whatever he wants. You're making the point that me and you were talking about, I think personally on Monday, uh, about that whole Mizzou controversy in 2014 or 2015, where the black gay kid that started the trouble at the University of Mizzou because he said, in off campus, someone drove by and called him the N word. And he said, Mizzou is a hostile place for black people. He's student body president and he's homecoming king. <laughs> and he's black and gay. And I'm like, most people would call that the dream college scenario. I'm president of the student body and I'm homecoming king. I don't know how Mizzou could have been any more inclusive, supportive of this kid. 
other than, you know, they could have stopped and assassinated the random guy that drove by in a truck and called him the N-word. And I'm just, if that little single experience, some rando, when you're the homecoming king and you're the student body president and some idiot drives by and exposes his stupidity and frames himself as a low life by calling you a name, if that ruins your experience at Mizzou, uh, guess what guys? Uh, my friends from Good Ranchers are actually here in town and here at the studio. And uh, you know what? They cooked me up something. <laughs> this isn't exactly what I needed. I, I try, I'm gonna get rid of the bread and just go with the meat. Uh, but can, can you guys see this? This wonderful uh, meal uh, that they prepared for me, the steak and the chicken and the hamburger. Uh, I love Good Ranchers and so should you. Good Ranchers is a great Christmas gift for someone in your family. Don't buy another gadget that ends up breaking before New Year's. Instead, give them Good Ranchers, a box of 100% American meat that's steakhouse quality from parents to siblings, friends, coworkers, and everyone in between. They'll all love the delicious cuts Good Ranchers deliver straight to their door. Give a gift they'll remember for years to come. Get your Good Ranchers box or gift card today. Tis the season for opening hearts and full stomachs and filling full stomachs. So buy Good Ranchers with the, go with the code FEARLESS to get $20 off and free shipping. Just go to GoodRanchers.com FEARLESS or use the promo code FEARLESS at checkout to take advantage of this special holiday offer. I love Good Ranchers because Good Ranchers loves me and they love this show and they love our point of view. Good Fearless Soldier supports Good Ranchers. All right, stick around. Korean Cosell, next. Are you miserable? Haven't been on a date in years? Are you still upset that the cool kids bullied you in junior high school? Mixed race and yearning for the street cred of the homies? Or maybe you're just an angry, radicalized woman who lacks the skills and allure that Kamala Harris used to attract a Willie Brown. Hi, my name is Dr. Van Joan. I am the head of DIE for the Alphabet Mafia. D-I-E stands for Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. Die. Does that sound fun? If you're bitter about your life, you're mad about the way God made you, and you're a total loser, then you are a prime candidate to become a made man or made woman in the Alphabet Mafia. You wanna know more about us? We're a for-profit coalition of organizations funded by George Soros. We're Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, and critical race theory, all rolled into one. We burn and loot cities, we redefine marriage, and we're also in the process of redefining and expanding gender identities. If you have a writing flair, you would be a good fit at the New York Times. We're rewriting history, and we're helping Americans understand that this country is a massive failure. Do you have a violent criminal history? Maybe you've done time in prison for pedophilia. Great. Maybe even some domestic violence. And you can't find the right job in corporate America? No problem. At DIE, you're a perfect candidate to loot, burn, and terrorize black communities. You could be the next Joseph Rodenbaum. So don't miss your chance to kill America. Call us right now at 1-800-555-MARA. That's 1-800-555. Let's all make America racist again. All right, welcome back. Uh, time for the Korean Cosell, uh, Steve Kim, uh, one of the best, I mean, he, he's good on all sports, good on college football, he's good on NFL football, he's, he's good, on, but he's a great media critic. 
you know, second only to me as a media critic, and that's pretty strong. Uh, and so I wanted to do a little media discussion here uh, with the Korean co sell Steve Kim. Uh, Steve, I read an interesting story uh, in Sports Illustrated or some other sites. A lot of people picked up on it. Michelle Beadle, former ESPN broadcaster, used to host NBA Countdown, uh, used to host Sports Nation along with Colin Cowherd, and then did it with Marcellus Wiley. She keeps talking about, and she went on a podcast with Ethan Strauss, the House of Strauss, and talked about that LeBron James wanted her fired at ESPN mm. as the host of NBA Countdown. Uh, let me see if I can read a direct, a direct quote here. I think he had a person at the network that he wanted to be the host of NBA Countdown. He does not like me, and I honestly have stopped trying to figure out why. For some reason, it goes back years. I've been around Maverick Carter. He refused to shake my hand. I have no idea why. Uh, she then goes on to say, what do I care about? Is how, what I care about is how my bosses respond, because that really, at the end of the day, is where any loyalty should have been. It is what it is. He didn't get me fired, so I do take solace in that. And the person he didn't want, he, he wanted, didn't get the job. So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we all win. Uh, I, I, I wanted your thoughts. Do you, one, do you buy it that LeBron James wanted Michelle Beadle fired? I do. Uh, there's some speculation that uh, LeBron wanted Rachel Nichols to get the job. Uh, there's others that think LeBron wanted. Uh, Maria Taylor, who eventually did get the job to get the job. Uh, your thoughts, Steve? Well, Jason, what happens here is nothing new. I see it in boxing all the time. This is a situation about relationships and access. And more and more, Jay, and I know this must have been disconcerting to you, that if you're too much of a truth teller and you don't play the role of a publicist, you lose favor with the subject and all of a sudden you're not getting the scoops, you're not getting the news, you're not getting the interviews or the exclusives. Now, as it relates to LeBron, this is where it's really troubling across the board. There's, there really is no more a separation of church and state, and in this case, league and individual and network. And the way the NBA and ESPN have empowered LeBron and his crew, well, the LeBron tail begins to wag the network and league dog. So I believe all of this is plausible because I've seen it in boxing on a much smaller level. And I, I do find it interesting that, look, what I find interesting is, as I learn more about the entertainment realm, and I was very naive about this even six, seven years ago, is that there are certain agencies now that they don't just represent athletes, but they also represent the broadcasters. So a lot of the times, these things are intersectional or intersected, so certain announcers or certain publicists or writers or journalists will not be able to say certain things about certain athletes. And then certain athletes would say, well, that guy's pretty good with us. He's part of our team. We're going to do a documentary or a project here. I think we should get him. He's good. So you develop that relationship. So that's where this whole thing has changed, that there really is no more separation of church and state. Here was the thing Beatles said that bothered me. Uh, she said, I had a job that was wanted by people. I get it. I get it. I wanted it too. It was a great job. In the game of trying to get that job, I learned that people were willing to do things that I just wasn't going to do. I wasn't going to hmm. play games with the media. I wasn't going to spread lies. Hmm. This nearly made my head explode <laughs> because... I remember Michelle Beadle going after Stephen A. Smith publicly when Stephen A. Mm. Smith spoke inarticulately about the Ray Rice situation or some kind of domestic violence situation. And, and he said something about provocation and, you know, make sure you're not doing anything that provokes. And Michelle Beadle went on a, a Twitter tirade against Stephen A. Smith and just fan those flames. And I think Stephen A. had to issue an apology or whatever. But she tried to damage Stephen A.'s career because he spoke inarticulately. And, 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 not, and let's say it was wrong thing for what <clears throat> Stephen A. did. How dangerous was it? Did it require that kind of response? No, she did that to build her own brand and to, you know, 
stand on Stephen A. Smith's shoulders and head and elevate herself. So, you know, I, th this is the phoniness of what she's <laughs> saying here as if oh, I didn't play those games and LeBron James wanted me fired, Bob. Well, you wanted Stephen A. Smith fired. So, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I just find Michelle Beadle phony. Yeah, I mean, she went full Karen Beadle there. And let's be honest. And look, as it relates to what Stephen A. Smith said, can we be completely blunt about it? Those conversations and the things that he said are probably uttered in a lot of private settings and barber shops, in the locker room, poker game around the table. The issue is with Stephen A., with the platform that he has, if you're too strong in your stance, it almost seeps into victim shaming, and that's where you have to be careful. Um, but as it relates to Karen Beadle, uh, she got really bitter at the end. I, I remember that she actually said, well, I, I don't watch the National Football League. And I'm thinking to myself, in your position, that's actually the first thing you should be watching. And then she turned very bitter. At and then also she, she turned old. And I think with female reporters, for the most part, that the way you look, the aesthetic that you provide for the viewer, the eye candy, for lack of a better term, is important. And, uh, you know, they, we, look, women and age, women and men age differently. And unfortunately, whether it's fair or not, this is the game that everyone plays that once you lose a couple of inches on that fastball, you're judged a little bit differently. So I, I do agree with you. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Ms. Beetle says, I don't have an agenda, just honesty. When it seems to me everything she's saying the last couple of weeks is based on a particular agenda. I would push back against your attractive issue because I, I, I think that Beetle was, she had her position as a personality and as the girl every guy wanted to drink beers with and talk sports with and you know, as it turns out, as we got to know her more and more, it's like, no, nah, I really don't want to talk sports with her. <laughs> she doesn't know much and she'll play the feminist card on me and she'll play the woke card on me. And so that's not really the hardcore sports fan isn't, you know, really doesn't have a lot in common with Michelle Beadle. She became a woke politician on ESPN. And, and, you know, that's a choice she made. But I, I don't think she's not being held to the same standard as a lot of the Instagram models, the Kari Champions, the uh, Samantha Ponders, uh, th those types, of, even to some, even Maria Taylor to some degree when she was there. Well, uh, I, I'll, go ahead. Well, Jason, I, I'll, I'll agree with you on this. Does she have more substance than the names that you mentioned Yes, but unfortunately, and again, I didn't make the rules and I don't have to play That's by them. That's up for debate. Okay, but my, my view is this, that as a woman, if you are fairly attractive, which Michelle Beadle is, those things matter. Whether they're fair or not, we don't know. And then when she turns bitter, that becomes another negative. But can we be honest about it, Jason? If you're at a sports bar, would you rather talk sports and hang out with the more attractive woman or the one that can recite baseball stats like Bill James? Let's be honest about this. Come on, Jay. Come clean. I'm going to come clean and say this. That there's, I don't really want to talk sports with women. <laughs> I'm just... Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm just keeping it all the way real. I do it. <laughs> I do, but again, I talk football and basketball, and they don't wow. talk about it the way that I talk about it. And they don't know what I know, for the most part. I'm not saying, no, trust me, there's some basketball players, former basketball players that know far more about basketball than I do. But again, when I want to talk basketball, I got a bunch of guy friends that played a high level of college basketball, high level of professional basketball, I, I can go talk it with people that are actually in the arena. And, and then some of my male friends are like, they're nuts about the NBA and football. And so part of this is just me being all the way around. And, and, and there are some talented. I think Cassidy Hubbard is a really talented basketball broadcaster. 
And maybe if we were friends, me and her would talk basketball, but we're not. And, and just the people I talk basketball with generally play basketball against other boys or men most of their life. Uh, and so, but let me just say, I don't really enjoy talking sports with very many people at all. Mm. Now, seriously, mm -hmm. you know, but there's Jay. a group of former athletes that I love talking sports with. There's some sports writers and sports media personalities that are like hardcore fans that know the game inside out, like yourself, that I love talking boxing and sports with. But there's a lot of people, casual fans, and that's what most women are, casual sports fans. I don't have any interest in talking sports with them. But they, Jay. They, I'm a weird person. And I don't like small talk. And much of the you, this talk Jay. has to be so small to include a woman in my sports conversation that it just bores the hell out of me. Look, you have to have substantial knowledge, and you're right, but we're a little bit different given the fact we're in the media and we have access to people that are in the industry. Look, I love boxing, and I'm lucky I get to talk to a Bob Arum. I get to talk to a young heavyweight by the name of Jared Anderson last week. I, I get to talk to people within the sport that are power brokers that are doing it. I got to interview George Cambosis last week, and you're right. So it's a little bit different for us given our position and our access, uh, and I really do believe that when guys say, oh, I, I, I want a girl that knows sports and enjoys it, I think that's really a coded phrase for, I want a girl that if I'm with her in a relationship, she's not going to ask me, oh, my God, do you really have to watch every game? I think that's the truth of the matter. I, I, I think it's one of the most cliche. I want a girl that loves – I want a girl – who allows me to watch sports without bothering me. I want a girl who knows the stock market and has great stock tips. I want a girl who has, you know, uh, <laughs> seriously. And also, th there's and things also, that, yeah. And let's yeah, be honest, I also want a girl that hits the squat rack. Have an appreciation for working out. <laughs> that matters too, right, TJ? Come on, chime in. You're, 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 I'm drowning out here. Jeez. <laughs> no doubt about it. I, I will tell you, my wife is a big sports fan. We've never had a sports conversation one time in our lives. We watch the sports together, and that's fun. And we'll go to games together, and that's fun. We don't break down the Cardinals' batting lineup. That would be crazy. I don't care what her opinion is. Frankly, she doesn't care what my opinion is. We just want to sit there and watch the game. I want a woman that's an expert on raising our kids. Yes. <laughs> that's far more important than what she knows about Wilt Chamberlain, LeBron James, or Tom Brady. Uh, I can get all that superficial stuff from my male friends uh, <laughs> and me. Uh, so anyway, uh, the other thing I wanted to throw out, and we got to be a little quick because we went longer on that than I thought, uh, Aiden Hutchinson, I think, I really believe this. I think the Michigan defensive end is going to win the Heisman Trophy. Uh, I, I know people think Bryce Young is going to win it because of his last game against Georgia, but I think Aiden Hutchinson had a better season, and I think there's some momentum behind him. If, if you look at his performance against Ohio State in Michigan's biggest game of the year, I think Aiden Hutchinson is going to win the Heisman Trophy. Jay, I said CJ, it about a Steve, week ago yeah. uh, that he was the best player on the field every single time Michigan played a game. And if you look at the definition of Heisman Trophy, it's the most outstanding player. But somewhere around the way, 10 years ago, it became who's the best quarterback on a team or an, a skill player about four of like last 70 years. And then it became that's on a national title contender. So Kenny Pickett's out. Obviously, Bryce Young is in the discussion. And then C.J. Stroud was in the discussion until about two weeks ago. It, it, when I look at Hutchinson, and this is the lazy white guy comparison. I have to do it. Sorry, T.J. He looks like J.J. Mm -hmm. Watt 2.0. He's 6'6", 265. And you could stand him up on the edge. You could play with his hand on the ground. He can also play the run. He's at the very good edge, and he's physical. And when we were describing a player in their best moments, what he did against Ohio State, I said to myself, this is another occasion where a guy who doesn't handle the ball is the best player. And I've seen this happen before. Warren Sapp in 94. In 1997 or 98, Orlando Pace may have been the best offensive lineman I've ever seen. 
But they were never in the discussion, and it's been happened one time, though, Jay. That's, this is the problem with our theory and our belief. Outside of Charles Woodson in 1997, every other Heisman Trophy winner in the last 75, 80 years has been an offensive skill position player. That's the problem. If there was going to be a defensive player in my lifetime, I guess Charles Woodson didn't want a lifetime, but in my lifetime of, of watching sports closely, it would have been in Dominican Sue. I played mm. against him in 2010. There has never been a more dominant defensive player that I have watched with my own eyes than in Dominican Sue. He, that 2000, nah, I guess it was 2009, that 2009 Texas team had Colt McCoy not pinched a nerve in his arm to start the national championship, wins the national championship against that Alabama dynasty that we've seen now. That was one of the best, that Texas team was one of the best college football teams that we would have seen and don't even talk about now because of what happened. And Dominican Sue had Nebraska within one second of beating them in the yeah. Big 12 championship game because no one could block him no matter if you sent three or four or five guys. So, Having watched that, I mean, that is, if you watch Aaron Donald now in the NFL, and Dominican Sue was doing that on the college level, and he was in the Big 12, not at Pitt, so everybody saw it. I mean, what we saw out of Dominican Sue was a different level. Dominican Sue was a more dominant player than Aiden Hutchinson, at least from my eyes. Mm. The difference is, when the, the reason, and I, and I think Steve's exactly right here, the Heisman has become not only the best offensive player, oftentimes the best quarterback, the way we look at best players who can have the biggest impact, not the guy who's the best player at his position or excels the most of anybody else. Otherwise, we'd have a kicker that kicks 75-yard field goals and we'd have to hand him the Heisman. So in, in my opinion, you look at Bryce Young, what he's done. He had his Heisman moment against Auburn, had the best throw of any quarterback that he's had this season on the outside shoulder to Brooks there to tie the game. And then he had the Heisman game against Georgia. That Georgia defense, when you look at the stats, is unbelievable. They allowed 66 total points in SEC play. Uh, they had, that's an average of 8.25, okay? Alabama scored 24 points in the second quarter. So they scored three times as many points in the second quarter as they allowed, mm. as Georgia allowed, on average for the season in SEC play. What he did against the very best team Probably earns him this spot. If you go look at the, at the, um, the Vegas odds, uh, Bryce Young is running away with this thing. And the last thing I'll say is it is the – we picked the Heisman over the last decade over the last impression. The last impression was pretty darn good for Bryce Young. And so what TJ just said there and what you said as well, Steve, again, is, this is why I talk sports with guys because I just don't <laughs> think a woman would have made that Indama Kinsu analogy – uh, and sparked me to give that some thought. I saw Indominus Sue play against Ball State, and we, we should have beat him at, at Nebraska. Uh, you, you, I do remember him being a great college player. The, the greatest defensive player that I remember, and I can go all the way back to Hugh Green, but I don't really remember it. Greatest college defensive player that I've ever seen was Warren Sapp. Mm -hmm. Warren Sapp at the University of Miami took on Nebraska's Corn-fed, yes. steroid-fed offensive line, <laughs> and oh, I mean it was. I just I looked at that, and being a former college offensive lineman, I looked I looked at Warren Sapp that year and was like, that's my worst nightmare. Mm. That guy would just I, I wouldn't sleep, and I would probably come up with a reason not to play. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, we got to roll. I I want to get out to Joy Pullman. She's written a story. Uh, about a minister in Finland that's being prosecuted on criminal charges for preaching Christianity. Hurt. All right, welcome back. Uh, we want to bring in Joy Pullman. She's an executive editor at the Federalist. Uh, she's an accomplished author. Her books include The Education Invasion, which is about the common core. She's a mother of six and has also authored books for children. Uh, today we're bringing in Joy because she's written a story about a case in Finland that I think could have worldwide implications and could certainly affect uh, believers and pastors and churches and religion right here in America, but I'm going to let Joy explain why this case in Finland and the nature of this case in Finland and why it could potentially have impact here in America. 
Uh, Joy, uh, welcome to the show. And, and okay. tell us about uh, this case in Finland. Well, I heard about it, um, you know, so people were just asking me if I had heard about this case internationally and I hadn't. So I just followed up to learn more about it. And as I did, I learned how really interesting it is and unusual. When I talked with Alliance Defending Freedom attorneys, they actually have an international base of attorney, attorneys um, abroad. And so I talked um, with a fellow there. He explained to me that this case with this Finnish pastor is actually kind of seen as a canary in the coal mine for religious freedom worldwide. Because what's happening is this bishop who is over um, an association of a number of churches that really hold fast to the Bible's historic teachings about what marriage and sex are for. Um, he is being brought up on criminal charges for literally um, saying what the Bible says about those issues. And in fact, um, uh, uh, he is the publisher of a small book that, that is talking about what the Bible teaches about marriage. And he um, and he published it, it was written by another uh, a member of uh, his church, a member of parliament in Finland. And she's also being um, brought up on these criminal charges, the hate crimes charges. And one of the counts against her is literally for tweeting a picture of a Bible verse. So uh, the, the, the lawyers told me this is the first time that there have been criminal charges filed against a pastor for preaching the word of God. And the, uh, the, his, he's possibly facing up to two years in prison or fines. Um, as a result, his case goes to trial in January. So I think a lot of Americans will hear about this and go, oh, well, that's Finland. No mm -hmm. way that could ever happen in America. But I, I'm telling you, as we become more of a globalist country and try to adopt the customs, practices, standards of other countries, I, I think we could be headed down this road, whereas any speech that, uh, speaks against same-sex marriage or homosexuality can be defined as hate speech. And, and we could eventually, it could be 10, 15 years, but at some point we could have those type standards and those of us that are believers and believe in the gospel as it was written originally and not these new iterations that everybody's coming out with, we could be persecuted for, for saying those things. That's right. And so what's been happening in the United States is, you know, people are probably possibly aware of all around and even local municipalities and cities and at the state and the federal level, there are attempts to, and some of them are successful. Some of these laws are on the books in the United States, the same kind of laws that are being used to prosecute this Finnish bishop. They're called hate crimes, but what, what they really do is criminalize speech. And so the United States, of course, has a First Amendment that protects our right to both free speech and our religious exercise in public of our beliefs. But these hate crimes, these they, they kind of tack on to, you know, the classic thing everybody, you know, has agreed we accept in our society is treating people equally no matter what they look like. And so these new ones, though, want us to treat people and talk about them the same way, no matter what their sexual behavior are, which is a completely different category. So well, we also have hate crimes laws that are being passed in the United States, the same kind that are being used to process to prosecute this Finnish bishop, and they are criminalizing, um, and they are a direct assault on Americans' First Amendment rights to freely speak and freely exercise our religion. What advice would you give us? How do we combat this movement to, to some degree? I feel like there's, they, they have so much wind at their back and so much momentum because we're at sleep at the wheel. We take these rights for granted. We, take, we still think we're living in a, a Judeo-Christian culture, and I don't think we are. I think we're living yeah. in a very secular culture, and social media has so much influence over what we're allowed to say and what we're allowed to believe, and social media is just completely secular. What, what can we do to push back? 
Well, I think one thing that really needs to happen is that Christians need to reassess their relationship with the Republican Party. And what that means is we've really allowed Republican office holders to get away with telling us that they support religious liberty while really not doing much to actually protect religious liberty while in office. I'll give you an example. So I live in Indiana and I was here when Mike Pence was our governor. And he, while he was vice president for President Trump, went around the nation preaching religious liberty. But while he was the governor here in Indiana, he unleashed the cancel culture using um, these hate crimes laws to persecute Christians by writing into Indiana law these hate crimes protections specifically for sexual behavior. And so the success of the big business cancel culture here in 2015 in Indiana led to repeated, and now we see this as endemic, where big corporations are trying to use their power to push around state legislatures run by Republicans. And so, you know, those of us who want Republicans to actually make good on those promises need to hold their heat feet to the fire and say, I'm not going to vote for you. I'm going to help primary you. If you don't make good on that promise with your action when you get to the legislature, speeches are not good enough. My First Amendment right to live as a Christian is protected by the Constitution, and you need to use your power to protect me. Otherwise, I'm not going to vote for you again, and I'm not going to pretend that the Republican Party is great on this issue when they don't, you know, show me the money. They don't follow up those great words with any actions and power, use of their power on the legislative front. Joy, you've nailed it. You've hammered it, and and you also brought up what I think is even a bigger threat, it's not just the courts, it's corporate America, and it's keeping your job if you have some of these traditional biblical beliefs. Part of the main reason I'm here at The Blaze and left corporate media is because, and again, I don't wanna cast aspersions on anybody I work for at ESPN or, or Fox Sports or whatever, but they maintain a culture in corporate media where Jesus is just a word they're not comfortable with you talking about on air. And, and so I, I, I literally just wanted the freedom to express what I truly believe and use the word Jesus when I think appropriate and be able to engage with athletes and other celebrities or just other newsmakers about faith uh, comfortably. And so that's why I, but, but I think the real threat to most Americans is like this corporate culture we've created where if you're not 1000% on board with the LGBT agenda, LGBT yeah, agenda, uh, you could get run out of your job very easily and everybody will be applauding while you're being escorted out of the building. Well, and, and when that happens, you know, people need to understand that that is an extreme minority that's controlling all of the rest of us and making us all scared. You know, two thirds of Americans call themselves Christians. The majority of Americans do not support cancel culture and all of this pressure on people. You know, the people who do all these lawsuits, who push for these sexual orientation, gender identity, quote unquote, hate crimes laws based on sexuality, they are an extremist minority in this country. But the but when the 67 percent of us who are Christians, when the majority of us who support free speech, when we are silent and when we allow the extremist behavior to control and shut us up, that is what is creating the dynamic that you know we're talking about right now. So another thing that people really need to do is to start you know, stop being afraid, start using wherever you can respectfully and politely, you know, share your beliefs as appropriate. And, you know, don't don't be afraid and don't be controlled by an extremist minority who's trying to destroy our constitutional way of life. Joy, I want to end on this note. I'm also from Indianapolis originally, the east side of Indianapolis. I'm not sure what part of Indiana you're from, but uh, you sound like the Indiana people and women that I grew up with and know, uh, hats off to you and keep doing great journalistic work. Oh, same to you, thank you. All right, uh, you're watching on youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Joy is the perfect segue to Tennessee Harmony. Pastor Anthony Walker uh, will, be here, will, be, will be here with us in the next segment. Uh, Pastor Harrington, uh, after working me and Pastor Walker last Sunday, 
He skips out on us on this Wednesday. Pastor Harrington can't be here, so it'll be Anthony Walker, myself, and TJ Moe will be back. <laughs> Welcome back. It's Wednesday. It's time for some Tennessee Harmony. As I just told you when we wrapped up with Joy uh, Pullman, uh, Pastor Anthony Walker is here with us from Renew.org. Uh, Pastor Bobby Harrington is not with us. Uh, T.J. Moe, though, is joining us, and T.J. is a man of faith uh, as well, not a minister. Like So, Pastor Anthony, you're our lone expert here today. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to just briefly talk about Pastor Anthony and I uh, spoke uh, this past Sunday at Pastor Harrington's church, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and discipleship is always a topic that comes up between both you and Bobby all the time, and it came up on uh, Sunday. And it made me want to talk with you, Anthony, about Deion Sanders and uh, him bringing the Instagram model, Brittany Renner. She's an infamous Instagram model. She, she's kind of known as someone that uh, preys or preys on young men and athletes. And, and it just struck me, Anthony, in, in one regard, because I know and like Dion. I do too. And Dion, I believe, has a relationship with God. But I think like a lot of celebrities and just just a lot of people, he needs discipleship as well. And, and, and I think on Sunday, Bobby put up something and talked about basically people who try to minister themselves. I forget what he called it, mm -hmm. but it was about, you know, the, they personalize religion and think they're kind of the expert on it. And, and that's my kind of takeaway with Dion, mm -hmm. is that he's kind of doing his, he's definitely has a faith in God, but he's kind of doing it on his own and tailoring it to his persona. And, and perhaps he's not discipling the proper way, because, and, and let, let's, give me one more second. I'm gonna just say that I, I think that we make a mistake a lot of times of like, hey, we gotta tell kids about all the bad things that are out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we forget that the gospel actually is the good news. <laughs> right, right. And, and that maybe the best way to disciple is like, here's all the great things that are available to you yeah. if you do the right things. Yeah. Uh, and so, but I see a lot of people that want to Here's all the bad that can happen. Let me put this in your face so you know it's out there. And that's what I think Dion was doing here with Brittany Renner. Let's, let's play the clip and then we'll get some expert advice. and they see you. And what happens? They try to get off in them DMs and <laughs> kind of take us on the journey of how this is played out. I mean, honey, like, I feel like for my DMs, it's like a Nike store. There's nothing but checks. So it just, for me, I feel like... Hold when... on, hold on, hold on. They missed that game. <laughs> nothing but blue checks. They missed that game right there. She says like a Nike store. It's like a Nike store. There's nothing but blue checks. So honestly, when you reach a certain status, you can have the pick of the litter. So for she, me... She don't mean checks. Paper. She mean <coughs> blue, blue checks. I'm talking heavy Verified. hitters. Some of y'all's favorite rappers, uh, NBA players, football players. It's like, <coughs> to me, once you reach that level just of popularity, the world is your oyster. You can do whatever you want. And for me, my whole journey on here, I felt like 
my life almost felt like I was in Disney World, like I lived in Disney World. Like you get to skip the line, you get privilege. Like people just want to be next to you. They don't even see you as human anymore. And you can either, you know, use it to your advantage and maybe abuse it, or you can, you know, try to make something happen. So a lot of guys who are in my DM, you're in my DM because of, I'm Brittany Renner. And so, I, I mean, just off the top of my head, if, if there had been someone there espousing a biblical worldview, they would be talking about, man, if you embrace Christ, you get this, you get that, you get blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But instead, we got Brittany Renner. I, I just, what advice, Anthony, or how should we, what should we think about Dion here and his way of discipling these young guys? You know, we had uh, a segment where we talked about what happened with Urban Meyer. And, and I told you how sometimes we tell on ourselves when we're expressing what we express. If you listen to what she said there, she said, sometimes I feel like I'm in Disney World. And Disney World is a place of fantasy, not reality. And one of the things that, or two of the things I should say that men in particular struggle with is fantasy and reality. We think back to King David. David struggled with fantasy and reality. He tried to make his fantasy, seeing Bathsheba, his reality, thus killing his, uh, her husband, I mean, love child, all of that. So that was one thing that stood out. The other thing that stood out, she said that they don't even see me as human. And in some instances, yes, those people who are perusing her Instagram are not looking at her for the humanity of who she is. They're looking at what the lust can bring them and make them feel emotionally. So, you know, yes, you just told on yourself, this isn't about reality. It's about fantasy. It's about self-indulgence. So, you know, I, I understand uh, to some degree why Dion was trying to do this. And, and, I, and I hope that the reason is from uh, the best place he could. He's probably bringing someone in who is an expert in her field. And he's trying to, as he said to the guys, give them some game about what's really out there. Uh, but from a biblical perspective and what we try to do uh, as those who you know, study God's word, try to live by his word, we got to look at this from a different perspective. Um, one of the scriptures I wish I had given you guys because it just hit me as it was coming through. But there's a passage in James, James chapter three, where James uh, gives a difference between the world's wisdom and godly wisdom. OK, the world's wisdom is self-indulgent. The world's wisdom uh, is cutthroat. OK, and you can survive with that kind of stuff in the world. You can make it through the world with that kind of thing. But it doesn't produce godliness. It begins at James 313. But he differentiates that with godly wisdom, which is first pure, uh, honest, these things that lead to godliness. So I say that because what Dion said, if you heard in the clip, he said they missed that game. OK, the word game, you know, is a street term for world wisdom. It's street smarts. Um, and, and the game may help you survive, but it doesn't transform you. It doesn't make you any better. Um, you know, one of the examples I can think of are the uh, street pharmacists, <laughs> drug dealers. These are some these are some guys who are very street smart. They are uh, mathematical geniuses. They calculate, you know, the metric system better than we do. They got kilos and all of this. Uh, they are body language experts. They can tell who's lying, who's afraid, who's this and that uh, from a mile away. They got all of that. They're wise enough in the streets to survive. But you're not passing that wisdom down to transform lives, to make better men, to make a better world. That's not what that's going to. So when I hear this, when I even hear what she was saying in the brief clip that you gave about what she's doing. Hey, when you get to my status, you get checks in your DM for what? What is this transforming? How is it making these men better? How is it making her better? What wisdom are we transcending? We're giving game and game again 
is about survival. It's about just meandering through the world. You want to get say something to get a girl at the bar. Let me give you some game. Right. You want to uh, make it through in the hood. Let me give you some game. But if you want to transform as a man. Game ain't what you want. That, that's not it. So so that was, you know, and I know, you know, I, well, I shouldn't say I know. I hope that he was coming. Dion was coming from that perspective of I, I want to give these guys some warning about where they're going. But I think in one of your episodes, you spoke about this bringing P.J. Washington. He can tell you the downfall of it. Uh, bring in some of the guys you uh, I think you guys mentioned. Dion could be that guy to tell you some of the, you know, he's followed in some of those paths. Some of his ex teammates, Michael Irvin could tell you, hey, and, and, and what I was thinking of, you know, even in, you know, uh, thinking about this, um, there were guys who had lusted after, gone after that lifestyle, failed, lost money, lost relationship, lost family, lost marriage and then built themselves back up through God's word. Bring that guy in here. Now, I get it. Uh, We are visual creatures as men. So obviously bringing her in is the eye candy. He he already knows Dion does. Okay, you guys are already looking at it. We're going to bring in and let her talk. The problem is they're going to spend most of their time focusing on the package and not the contents. And what we really want is the content. And so as a as a man that is developing other men and discipling other men, the best I can do for those guys is to help you to fall in love with the content of God's word, not the packaging. I want you to be a pursuer of truth, not necessarily the packaging, because if you spend too much time on the package, you may miss the truth. I think you mentioned it. You know, there were guys in there. That's all they could see. And, and then what they're going to leave with. They didn't probably take notes in their notes app. They're going to leave with man, you wouldn't believe who was at our. And that's it. That's all you got. Now, had they brought in a man to tell about the ups and downs and pitfalls? No, they're not going to be visually attracted to this guy. They're, they're not going to. Then they may even kind of doze. But if they are really pursuant of truth, which is what Coach Dion should be teaching these men to do, then they're going to get the contents. OK, have that guy to show. Hey, y'all remember this particular model? Yeah, I was with but Look at what that led me down into. Look at what happened to my life. But let me tell you more about how Jesus helped me to come out of that life. Much better dynamic still reaches the same goal. You know. As I'm listening to you, and maybe there's a 1% chance this happened, a 1% chance. You know, if, if there was any substance to be had from here, what Dion could have done, because again, when she walked into the room, you can hear all the excitement and the energy and blah, blah, blah. Give her 15 minutes to talk, and then get her on up out of there, mm-hmm. and then Dion could authentically tell the story, guys, I had all of this, Mm -hmm. all of them chasing me. Mm -hmm. And you see me write a book and talk about in interviews. I drove off a highway and tried to kill myself Mm -hmm. when I was Mm -hmm. lost in this. And so all the happiness that you think and all that excitement that it was created, she was here, blah, blah, blah. He could authentically say like, that's not happiness. Mm -hmm. That that's not fulfillment. That might have you on a highway in an expensive car trying to drive off the road and kill yourself. He could have been the content, sure. the expertise. Use her to draw their attention and then come in with it. And look, maybe there's a 1% chance that's what happened. Uh, and but, he's, but, he's, but you, you do know he's flexing, though, which is an, another part of how we disseminate the game, right? Dion, he's still Dion. Prime and time. so he's flexing to say, you guys see pictures of her. Let me show, bring in who I, and I can bring her in. Like that's a, which he's a, again, trying to impress the guys, trying to flex so that they can see. But again, if the lesson, are there nice things that come with the fame of football, the money, there are some nice things that can come with that. If the lesson though is beware of the dangers of chasing that, 
then I don't want to use that as the incentive to make you play better on the field. I, I want to use truth as the incentive. Be the best athlete you can be. Execute well. That kind of stuff may come and that kind of stuff can be a distraction from what's going on on the field. You ask. Um, and I had, I had a verse to to give about that. Um, Jesus did use a balanced approach in his huddle up with the disciples. Balanced meaning I don't just tell you the bad, 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 bad that could happen. But I also tell you the good that comes along with it. In Matthew uh, chapter 10, uh, he says, uh, verse 16, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they would deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before the governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, brother will deliver up brother to death and a father, his child and children shall rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So even in that passage, he's giving you here's some warning about what you're about to go out into. But here's what I have given you to strengthen you to overcome that. So I don't leave that threatened by, oh, my goodness, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. No, I've got enough. He's giving it to me. We're going to be fine. TJ, in the last decade, you've been in locker rooms, college locker rooms, where coaches are bringing in leaders and speakers to try to develop. You, I wanted to give you an opportunity. We talked about it earlier in the week, but I think you got a new thought on uh, what Dion should have done or, or what an example of the kind of speaker Dion should have perhaps brought in. When I was at Mizzou, we had motivational speakers come in. There was a guy that his whole theme was pedal downhill. And so that's all we had. He was a he was a 70 year old white guy. So the uh, the content was the only thing that came through. Um, the year after I left, Marcus Luttrell, the lone survivor, came in and he was very good. The guys raved about that. The thing I was trying to think of of kind of the ultimate juxtaposition to between what Dion did, and that is, as, as you pointed out, actually bring the temptation to the room. It's one thing to tell you about the temptation. It's another Ooh. one to provide you with it and sit it right there and say, hey, this is coming for you. Mm. Uh, my view has been, and we talked about this on, on the show, I think it was yesterday, that you provide, you instill the proper values and you give a verbal warning mm -hmm. about what may come. And you say, when this comes, remember these values. They will always be tried and true, and they'll get you through. So uh, Dion, a new coach, a guy who's trying to ultimately probably try to get back to Florida State, mm -hmm. <laughs> is doing what he has to do to succeed at, at a lower division to get there. Nick Saban does not have to worry about that. Nick mm. Saban has, uh, I think at this point, is widely considered the greatest college football coach that's ever existed. What he can do now is do whatever it takes to one build men and two win championships. Those two things, by the way, go together. I, I repeat myself. Okay, okay. So he, this this went viral, it was either last year or two years ago, brought in Ernie Johnson, TNT. And, um, and we'll have a clip here in a second. It's a little bit too long, so I'll describe to you the, the difference between bringing in a girl in booty shorts and what 65-year-old white guy Ernie Johnson had to say. Ernie's entire theme was that there is value in everyone, okay? His whole thing was, when I think of value, I think of my son. He told the story about how his wife had an idea of, she had seen on TV or somewhere, there was a bunch of special kids in Romania, special needs kids in Romania that needed help. They were in a warehouse. They said, we gotta go. So Ernie Johnson picks up and he goes to Romania and they're, and they're walking through with the head of the orphanage and, and they say, well, you take your pick, but..." Don't take that kid. He's no good. And Ernie was stunned. He said, imagine that. Mm. He said, we'll take him. We're taking him home right now. So shortly after, the kid is diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Most of those kids die as a teenager because their muscles don't ever grow. So he gets into high school, and, and his high school coach says, I need you on my team. 
I, I know you got no vertical, I need you on my team. The kid's in a wheelchair. And Ernie went and talked to him. He said, hey, what, why do you want him on the team? He said, I need him for, to teach my team two things that there will be nobody better at. One of them is to give maximum effort all the time because in order for that kid to move a single muscle, it was maximum effort. The second thing was have a heart for others. So kid doesn't speak very well, but one thing he would do and how he had his heart for others was he'd walk around, give this all the time. He said, you didn't have to say it to him first. He always said, love you too. He'd point at you, love you too. So he said the two things, maximum effort, heart for others. We can roll the tape and this is the end of the uh, talk. When you wake up in the morning, how am I gonna make somebody else's life better today? And there's a team much bigger than this. There's a, there's a team that is trying to make somebody's day better. That's all of us. I was just gonna wear this shirt today and I thought it'd be a little informal just to, to show up in a t-shirt. But this is what's underneath. Be a better human. How are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? Love you too. Mm. So you put those things together, a girl that walks in and says, oh my gosh. <laughs> and you got Ernie who opens his shirt and says, just be a better human. Which one's trying to build men? Ernie is a devout Christian. Uh, wears it on his sleeve, not all the time on the NBA TNT, but Ernie's just, you know, he's a grown man. Brittany Renner's still just a child even at 27. It's not Brittany's mm. fault. I, this is Dion's fault. I agree. I, I, I agree. It, it, it's, it's, Dion, I, I always say, I'm, I, I guess I give guys that I, I like, I give them this grace. I just, fame so complicates your journey. Yes. Fame and money. And, and we'll end on this, Anthony, because I, I would like your take. Because when I hear the parable, the story in the Bible about, or the scripture about it, it's like harder for a rich man mm -hmm. to get, see the gates of heaven than mm -hmm. to get a camel through the eye of a needle. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if people really understand, because what that conveys to me is like, man, money turns you out in a way in this society it takes you away from God. Mm. I really believe that. I, am I interpreting that properly? You, you're, you're interpreting it well. Um, Jesus is expressing in that money in and of itself. Now, scripture never identifies money as the evil, but money and the love of it, the love of money, that's the evil. Money is an enhancer. OK, so if I have these temptations, problems, et cetera, Sin is a result of desire and opportunity. Well, what will money do for that? Money can provide me a whole lot of opportunity to match up my desire. And so if, if I struggle with these desires anyway, but I don't have the opportunity, praise God, okay, I don't have the opportunity. And, you know, I know you got to work on my heart, et cetera. But now if I can pay and I can pay to keep you quiet, and I can pay off the, you know, paparazzi from get. I am in my own mess. And what can get me out of that? I know we got to go, but just real quickly. First John chapter two, this passage. Uh, first John two, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, what I see I want, what I see I want. That's all that's in the world, a whole bunch of what I see I want. The lust of the flesh, I want to experience it all. I'm looking and I want to experience. And the pride of life, what this makes me feel like over any and everybody else. Now, what some of those guys could leave that situation with one, I saw her, man, she is what I want. They could lust after her Two, I want to experience. You mentioned it on a couple of episodes like I want to experience that they're sitting there with that. And then three, 
as I'm showing everybody else, look at what I over what everybody else in here has. That's what the world has to offer. And so if I'm trying to get you not to focus on the world, I really need to cultivate. And I get it. I get it with Dion. He, he knows a lot of these guys in here have probably come from difficult er areas and they're trying to get up out of the hood and he's trying to motivate them. You want the cars, you want the women, you want the money. Hey, but that's really not what they want. What they really want is security for their family. I want to get out of this lifestyle. I want transformation in my life. I want to be better. God is the only thing that can do that. All other things are distractions from what God is trying to transform. And, and, and I was pointing out, I had a slide for it, the difference between a mentor and a disciple. You mentioned how we talk about discipleship uh, a lot in Renew and in the church. The Bible speaks of discipleship. Now, discipleship and discipling does involve mentorship. But a mentor is simply wise counsel or a trusted guide or a teacher or something. A disciple is a follower of Christ. And to disciple someone is to teach others how to follow Christ, to obey his teachings and to make other disciples. So, you know, I don't want to just hit on mentoring because what we do with mentors, uh, we take the advice. It sounds good. If I like it, go on. A disciple is saying, no, no, no. This is what following Jesus looks like. This is what it means for you to follow Jesus. It's not just walking behind him. It's actually doing what he commands us to do. And at some point, you're going to have to make somebody else be a disciple as well. Mentorship doesn't do that. So mm -hmm. discipling involves mentorship, but mentoring doesn't involve discipleship. And that's the difference. And so what we talk about Dion needs to be or needs to have those guys being discipled. Hey, guys, I'm following Christ. Paul says this in First Corinthians 11. I'm following Christ. I want you to follow me as I'm following Christ. And then I want you to get somebody else and show them how to follow Christ. Bringing in Brittany didn't get that for me. <laughs> Not following Christ. <laughs> anyway, uh, great job. Uh, great job, TJ, uh, Anthony, uh, always tremendous. All right, uh, don't forget to give me that five-star review on Apple. Don't forget to hit the subscribe and likes on YouTube. I think I hear tomorrow playing. That means we'll see you tomorrow. Nothing like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom No negotiation, my sister, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving all the when We all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be I just want